Welcome to our 10 a.m. worship assembly. It is so good to see all of you who are here in person, imagining all of you that are tuned in online through the live stream. So whether you're able to be here in the room with us or there at home or on vacation or wherever you are that, that you're using the live stream, it's great for us to be connected in this way this morning. Some of you are here for the very, very first time, and we are so excited about that. Some of you are return guests. So whatever has brought you here today, we're, we're just extremely grateful to you for choosing to spend the morning here in, in praise to God. Most of you know that Lois McNeil passed away last Wednesday, passed away peacefully at home. So our love and sympathy continue to go out to Betty and Jerry Cole and their loss of a beloved mother and, and mother-in-law. Visitation will be at Garrett Funeral Home on Thursday afternoon from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And the funeral service will be Friday here in the auditorium at 1030. Burial is going to follow in Coffeyville, Kansas at 2 o'clock. And Lois and her late husband were generous supporters of our mission efforts here. And the family has requested that in lieu of flowers, if you would like to make donations to our missions ministry, and especially, especially with Mission Sunday coming up next Sunday, uh, that would be a wonderful way to honor and remember Lois. Uh, thanks to everyone who worked so hard at the work day yesterday. After I'm finished, Chad is going to uh, share some more details about that. Sharon Timmy is having surgery tomorrow, and she asked for our prayers for her. She will be at uh, St. John in Tulsa. And Mac and Marie McCarthy have requested our prayers for their daughter, Heather, who is uh, faces, facing some crises in her life right now, and they just really feel the need for God's strength uh, and, and empowerment. After our morning assembly in the fellowship hall, Andrew's going to lead an informational meeting about a mission trip that's being planned for next spring to the city of children in Mexico. And so if you would like to learn more about that, please join Andrew in the fellowship hall immediately after services this morning. This evening, instead of an indoor 5 o'clock assembly, we're going to meet outdoors on the north side of the building. This is the annual American Heritage Girls Chili Fundraiser. Uh, $5, just five, you can donate plenty more if you want to, but just $5 will get you a bowl of chili and a drink and a cinnamon roll and all the fixings uh, with, the, with the chili. There will be a fireside devotional following the, the chili supper, and so bring your chairs, bring your blankets. We're going to take advantage of the mild weather here two or three more times in the fall before it starts getting cold. The Golden Age of Game Day is this Thursday from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the parlor. And let me back up to the visitation for Lois. That's from noon to 4. And so you would be able to go to visitation and also make the, the game day here from 2 to 4 in the parlor. There's going to be refreshments provided. So bring dominoes, bring, bring decks of cards, and that will be a wonderful time of fellowship together. And the Hobo Stew uh, is coming up later in the month of October. That sign-up list is on the desk at the Information Center. So please go ahead and sign up for that so they can begin making plans and preparations. Chad is going to share with us some more details about the work day. Nathan then about Mission Sunday next week. And then Gary Lynn will lead us in the Shepherd's Prayer. Good morning. Like Tim mentioned yesterday, we had a huge fellowship here. When we got to breakfast yesterday morning, David Updike did a count. We had 54 people show up yesterday morning, which is fantastic. Then I know we had probably another half dozen that straggled in after the fact. If I sit here and tried to list all the names, I'd end up forgetting somebody. So at this point, I'd ask you, if you were here yesterday and you participated, please stand up. And if you're at home, raise your hand so we can see that as well. So if you look around, there is a huge number that are in this building right now that worked in it. And you ask yourself, so what do we do besides come up here and eat? Well, there's a lot of stuff you can't see, but if you'll go look in these two dumpsters in the north and south parking lot and that big 30-yard dumpster across the street, they're all full. The bad part is we could probably fill that 30-yard dumpster up another five or six times before we actually got everything out of here that we needed to get done. 
If you look around, a lot of the carpet has been cleaned. The windows have been done. If you'll go to the front of the building and look at the flower bed, I don't think it's looked that good since this building was built some 40 years ago. Uh, there was lights put in, so you can see there's a lot of painting on the ceiling. Ceiling tiles were placed, wires were run. You got new thermostats over in the OC. There's a lot of things that are coming together. And this is a great event, not only to get all the stuff done here, but it was a time of fellowship. We enjoyed being around another. The weather was absolutely fantastic yesterday. We couldn't have asked for a better day. And as I look around, I'm always reminded of that adage. It says 10% of the people do 90% of the work. I'd almost really say it's 5% of the people do 95% of the work, but the ones that show up are workers. And if you weren't able to be here yesterday, there's always opportunities to serve. Come see myself, come see Richard Davis, Brian Streets, Steve Copeland, or Ron Lee. We've always got projects that need to be done. You can step in at any time. It does not have to be a maintenance day. But we're going to do this again in the spring. So again, I'm going to ask you if you got your phone, hold it up. It's going to be the first Saturday in May. So I don't think anything's on the calendar for 23 yet, unless Andrew's beat me to some stuff, which he's pretty good at doing. So go ahead and mark that. We're going to do it again. We would love to have you come out for, even if you just come out here and eat breakfast with us, we would like to see you here. But again, thank you to everybody. Now there is one person I'm going to mention by name, and that's Robert Wilson. He probably spends more time in this building doing maintenance function, electrical, audio, video, you name it, he does it. We need more workers like him to come out here and give him a hand. I almost think he lives in this building. And I'm glad he didn't shut my mic off when I said that. I didn't tell him I was going to do it. But anyway, again, a big thank you to everybody. I appreciate what was done. Okay, so next Sunday is uh, Mission Sunday, where we'll have the opportunity to give to support uh, our mission efforts uh, in a one-time basis or to pledge your support um, ongoing throughout the year. So I have a card today, and you should have one in front of you in the seat pocket. Uh, purple cards where you can give your intentions to give um, throughout the year. There's instructions there, though I know some of you don't follow instructions very well and write things on your own on these cards, um, but that's okay. Uh, as long as we're giving, um, there are, at the community tables in the back, there are buckets back there to put your card in or um, your donation uh, next week. Um, and so the question is, um, you know, what does that money go to? Um, like I said last week, the flags in the auditorium are, represent the places that we support. Um, and that's, you know, the, the Bible chairs at NSU, OU, and OSU. Um, we give money to those monthly. Um, to Brother V in India to support his work there at the orphanage and the churches there. Um, in Cambodia for Rich and Rhonda as they work with the Cambodian Bible Institute. Um, to Brandon and Katie Price who work for, with the Ukrainian Bible Institute, though not in Ukraine right now. Um, and Brandon will be here next Sunday. Um, all of our adult, high school and adult classes will be in here for class. And then Brandon will preach during the worship, so uh, make it for that as well. Also in Ukraine, um, we support several other guys. I'm not going to try and pronounce their last names, but I'll run through their first names real quick. Uh, Bogdan and Yuri and Valeri and Dennis and Dima and Sergey and Sasha and Alexander. Um, all those guys continue to work um, around Ukraine. Some of them have left uh, for other places working in Poland. Um, the Nicol Sasha and, and Nasia um, are in the Netherlands now. Um, and several of these guys continue to work in Ukraine and support uh, those that need help uh, in Ukraine while their families are, have fled to Poland. So these guys are away from their families right now. But we continue to support these guys in their works, and hopefully they'll go back to their normal locations at, at some point and continue to work with those congregations after being disrupted. Um, but again, Mission Sunday next Sunday, and that's our opportunity to support. Please take a, a purple card with you if you plan to, to pledge um, or, or think about that one-time donation. Um, next Sunday and be prayerful um, for all these guys as they continue to uh, work for the Lord in their different lo locations. Thanks. Four weeks ago today, Bill Dethridge was our speaker and he took from chapter 12 of the book of Acts where the Christians there at um, 
<clears throat> Jerusalem had gathered at Mary's house to have a diligent prayer for Peter, one of their heroes that was in prison, awaiting really an execution. And I think Bell's point was that it was a focused prayer. It was uh, one that didn't include a lot of things because on their mind was their, their hero, and they wanted to have the Lord to help, and hopefully he would be delivered. I'd like to add a little bit to that and then have a special prayer for another person that's in the uh, first century that we don't think much about. To add to that, I'm thinking after Peter came to the house and they had seen him alive, mystified by seeing him alive, they gave thanks. If, as, as we give thanks every once in a while for amens. And after the prayer, which hopefully won't be as long as all of this introduction, when we get to the part where we'll say, and the congregation said amen, I'd like for you to join us in that amen. Well, there's an unexpected hero in the New Testament. His name is Luke. Luke has written the book of Luke, which entails the life of Jesus from birth to the time that he went back into heaven. He also wrote one of the outstanding books, the book of Acts, which tells us about the creation of the church. We don't know much about Luke, but I want to use him as an unexpected hero that wrote something most important to the Christian faith, and that is the book of Acts. So let's pray together. Holy Father, we do thank you for the author of the books that give us a lot of hope, give us a lot of detail about our Lord and our Savior. More importantly, it gives us a glimpse of the early Christian church gives us the activities of the apostles. I don't know what would have happened if Luke hadn't have written those kind of things. As one of my friends, Ray Perrette, would say, if Luke didn't do it, the Lord would have found someone else to do it. But I'm thankful, Father, that Luke wrote those kind of things. He was writing a book just to be directed toward Theophilus, one of his friends, but it found its way into the canon, and we're so happy and so thankful that he did that. And through Jesus, Father, do we give thanks and praise to you because of Luke. And then the entire congregation would say to that, Amen. Good morning, church family. As Tim mentioned, if you're a guest with us today, thank you for being here. And we invite everybody to come before the throne of God. Imagine that scene in heaven where, A, our bodies won't be hurting anymore, amen? I mean, seriously, right? So uh, uh, let's stand together and sing these songs of praises to our Lord. On Zion's glorious summit stood a new
church. This morning I'll be reading Acts 17 verses 16 through 34. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating for foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus' resurrection and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting to the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. 
Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are er ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the, heaven, is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out, and he marked out their appointed times in history in the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for, for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own, peop as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with his justice by the man he, have, he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of, his, and a number of others. Thank you, Brady, and Lee, and Gary, and Chad, and Nathan. Uh, so many wonderful things going on here, and it's a wonderful blessing to be a part of this church family. On Monday through Wednesday of last week, I was in Searcy, Arkansas for the Harding Bible Lectureship. Uh, Danelle Basajo was able to make the trip with me, so it was great having eight hours in the car with him on the way up there and on the way back. He stayed on campus with Caleb Martin. On Monday night, I had the opportunity to get together with about a dozen of our college kids there, and it's just really great to see them on their home turf in their natural habitat while they're away at college and not just here on the weekends when, when they come back home. But among the, the lectures that I was able to attend was one on Tuesday morning that was entitled Adult Bible Classes That Make an Impact. And the session was presented by Josh Kincaid, who has served as the education minister at the Memorial Road Church in Edmond for the last uh, 14 years. And Josh is the brother of our son-in-law, Reese. And I tried to find a word that describes that relationship of the brother of your son-in-law. I'm sure in Swahili or Gaelic or something like that, there's a word that just means uh, the brother of your son-in-law. But I don't know of any other way in English uh, to, to put it. But Josh had a really great presentation full of, of great insights. One of the things that he talked about was how in churches historically and culturally we tend to do things in silos. And our, even our studies and focus on the Word of God can be in silos. So we have a Sunday morning Bible class on this subject, and then we have a sermon on this subject, and then we have a Sunday night sermon on this subject, and then we have a ladies' Bible class on this subject, and a Wednesday night class on this subject, and small group Bible discussions on this subject. And he suggested that maybe it would make sense to pool some of those onto the same subject. And he, he had something, it looked, the container looked like a big cocktail glass. I didn't ask him about it later, but I guess it was a cocktail of three of these different things. It had the morning Bible class and the morning sermon and small group Bible studies. And I just found that very encouraging and affirming since that's pretty much what we've been doing this year. Uh, not that we intentionally took something out of Memorial Road's playbook. We didn't even know it was in their playbook. Uh, it's just something that we thought 
there would be great benefit in, and, and there has been, as in our adult Bible classes and morning sermons and on Life Group Sundays, the, the Life Group Discussion Guide, we've been focusing on the same text, either out of Luke, like we did in the first six months of the year, and now through the book of Acts. Doing this in, in the worship time that we have together just gives us another 25 to 30 minutes to continue camping out on the same text. And instead of you know, doing that, instead of changing channels in the morning worship assembly and gives us extended focus on that text, which allows us to keep digging deeper into the Word of God. So this morning, out of Acts 17, rather than focusing on one aspect of the text, uh, I will be working even beyond the text that, that I had Brady read for us a moment ago. Just some quick hits and some bite-sized takeaways from elements throughout the entire chapter. And I want to take you back, first of all, to the last verse of chapter 16. Last week, we saw all these incredible things that happened in Philippi with the conversion of Lydia and her household, ultimately through the imprisonment of Paul and Silas, the conversion of the jailer and his household. And then they move on. And we're going to follow them in chapter 17 through Amphipolis and Apollonia and Thessalonica and Berea, ultimately to Athens. But I love what it says in the last verse of chapter 16. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, it's, been, it's become known that they're Roman citizens. Big trouble is to be had uh, for those who have beaten them without any kind of trial or conviction as Roman citizens. Paul and Silas are willing to let it go at that if the magistrates, magistrates come and bring them out personally. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they had been staying, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. This is encouragement in spite of some very, very serious things. We're going to find Paul in Corinth next week in Acts chapter 18 and when you start looking at what we call his second letter to the Corinthian church, probably in actuality his fourth letter to that church, in Acts 11 he, he mentions this litany of things he has suffered for the cause of Christ. Numerous imprisonments, of which we've just seen one in Philippi, being severely flogged, beaten with rods three times. One of those happened in Philippi once punished with the intent of execution by stoning. We saw that in Lystra back in chapter 14. He's shipwrecked three times. We're going to get to read about one of those shipwrecks in Acts chapter 27. He spent an entire day and night floating in the open sea. He was constantly on the move. He never settled anywhere for very long at a time. There was dangers in, in crossing massive rivers. There were dangers from bandits and thieves. There were Jews, there were Gentiles who were opposed to him in the city, in the country, at sea, regularly sleep deprived, without food and without adequate clothing to keep him warm in the winter. And we find him in one of these situations here when he gets out of jail. This is the day after he has been beaten with rods. He and Silas both, beaten with rods. Before the jailer and his household are baptized the night before, or in the night, the jailer washes their wounds, wounds that are still fresh. And I can't imagine after a night, there wasn't, you talk about sleep deprived, I don't think anybody slept that night. And yet, in that circumstance, when he goes back to Lydia's house, it's not like Paul and Silas walk in and say, you know, we have had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. And we could really use some encouragement right now. It's, it's been rough. The beating, the imprisonment. We were praying and singing at midnight. We didn't know there was going to be a jailbreak. We didn't know that there was going to be an earthquake and the chains fall off. And yet, in spite of the condition they were in, they encouraged Lydia in her household, the jailer in his household, maybe the slave girl whose name we do not know. I'd love to believe that she's a disciple by now. Maybe Euodia and Syntyche that we read about in his letter to that church are there. And then it says they left. I mean, in very short order. And both of them are probably limping 
and wincing and occasionally letting out a moan or a groan if they sit down for a little while and then have to stand up. And yet in that physical condition, they encourage other people. And that's the encouragement that so many of you provide to us as a church family just by being here on Sunday mornings. Um, even though you're persevering through hardships, even though you're dealing with illness, sometimes chronic illness, or undergoing cancer treatment, or you have mobility challenges, so you come in a wheelchair, or you use a walker, or a cane, or a scooter, or you have to bring supplemental oxygen with you. Uh, others of you are brought here by, by people you love and who love you. J.C. Schultz. J.C., I appreciated your encouragement last Sunday after, after the sermon. When I sat down over there, I heard, I heard your big amen when I, when I sat down. And Ray Dewey, who I don't believe is here today, and Caden Guess, uh, you are an encouragement to us because you were here. And it's just an example of faithfulness and love, love for God, love for brothers and sisters in Christ. So when I think about Paul and, and Silas, in the shape they were in, going back and encouraging the church, I think about many of, of you. The charge against them in Thessalonica, verses 2 and 3 of chapter 17 as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, uh, on, and on three Sabbath, Sabbath days, he reasoned with them. We'll talk about this word when we get to Athens. But he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Uh, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Even though he's going to use radically different methods in Thessalonica and Berea and Athens, the focus of the message is the same. The message is about Jesus. The message is always about Jesus and what Jesus has done, particularly the resurrection. And his statement here among God-fearing, Scripture-believing people, he talks to these Jews and God-fearing Gentiles in the synagogue about how all this was predicted by Scripture both the Messiah's suffering and his resurrection. So it's incredible to think that Paul might have appropriated in that sermon what we often use before communion thoughts in Isaiah chapter 53, that that was one of his go-to passages, that the Messiah had to suffer. Isaiah said it 700 years ago. Psalm 1610, You will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. Maybe Paul used that scripture. Or from Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The one they thought that was dead and gone is now reigning at the right hand of God. Psalm 118, verse 32, the stone the builders rejected, there's not much more grisly rejection that can take place than crucifixion. But the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And many believed. A large number of God-fearing Greeks, it says in verse 4, and, and quite a few prominent women, but not everybody believed. Those that didn't believe caused the riot. It's, it's amazing that in Philippi, it's, it's Gentiles who caused the riot. Here, it's Jews who caused the riot. And they say these, these men have caused trouble all over the world. In other translations, including the King James Version that, that I grew up with, the, these men have turned the world upside down, which I still love that language. These men have taken the world, stood it on its head. Not that the charges against them were correct, that they were rebellious insurrectionists that were a threat to the government of Rome, but things would truly never be the same since Jesus had come. Back in 1996, back in the last century, in the last millennium, uh, the auto industry celebrated its centennial. We're having our centennial year this year. Uh, automobiles turned 100 back in 1996. And there was a writer for the Chicago Tribune, Jim uh, Matea, who selected, in his mind, what were the 10 cars that made a, a difference, the, the 10 cars that turned the transportation world upside down. And he listed the 1908 Ford Model T, the 10 Lizzie. It wasn't the first mass-produced car, but it was the first mass-produced car that really made a difference, that changed the way America traveled, including on, on Route 66. There was the 1941 Willis Jeep, 
that contributed to victory for the Allies in World War II and was the forerunner, pun intended, of sport utility vehicles that are everywhere now. The 1948 uh, Volkswagen Beetle, uh, Volkswagen in German means people's car. And it very much became the people's car uh, in Europe and in this country. In 1973, the Beetle surpassed the Model T as the world's best-selling car of all time. Doesn't hold that title anymore because a lot of water's gone under the bridge since then, but the Beetle's still the fourth best-selling car of all time. The 53 Chevy Corvette, the 64 Pontiac GTO, the 64 Ford Mustang. Mike Niquette has probably owned one of these cars. Um, Mike has owned 112-ish cars in his lifetime. Uh, not, some of them, not for very long, uh, but he has owned 112 different cars. And that's, that's just the sounding. Chris French, you may have owned or own one, one of these cars. You guys are sitting over here today. All right. Um, those cars made a difference. Transportation wouldn't be the same after they hit the road. And, and again, while the charges of these disbelieving Thessalonians wasn't true about any threat to the Roman government, uh, they, they were telling the truth when they said, these men say that there is another king, Jesus. They had heard them absolutely correctly on that one. There truly is another king, greater than any earthly monarch, uh, whether it's the, the dearly departed uh, Queen Elizabeth II, after 70 years of reign. Um, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, but I'm tempted to ask, you know, how many of you at least watered up a little bit at some point during the coverage of her death? And I caught my questioning, why am I tearing up? You know, I've, she's, not, she's not my sovereign, she's not my monarch. Uh, part of it's probably I'm getting older and, and things like that just hit me. I listened to a, a soft oldies station about a month ago for like two weeks. It was just a phase. It went away. Um, but I just like intentionally kept going to this soft oldies station. It's, it's another sign of the apocalypse. I don't know. Uh, or just that, that I'm getting older. But as incredible as her 70-year reign was, there's a greater sovereign. There's a greater king. Greater than Charles III, greater than any U.S. president, past, present, or future. Christ's kingdom will endure long after these kingdoms of man are gone. When they get to Berea, they find somewhat of a different reception, and we find this beautiful spirit among these Bereans in the synagogue there in that they were examining the scriptures daily uh, to test drive what Paul uh, was, was teaching there what Paul and, and Tylus, Silas and, and, and Timothy were saying. And I love that the Berean spirit is alive and well at the Broken Arrow Church just because of your love for and your devotion to and your commitment to and your regular participation in study of Scripture. And I'm just not talking about your individual devotional uh, reading of Scripture and meditation on Scripture, but what we do together what we just did in the last hour on Sunday mornings and what we'll do on Wednesday night and what the ladies will do on Tuesday morning and the college and young professional Bible studies, which I think are on Thursday nights and the high school Bible study, boys study tomorrow night, girls study on, on Tuesday night, the pop-up study that was at the Lemus' house on Friday night. The women's ministry is launching new studies this week. Uh, other studies that various ones of you have initiated, Heart Sisters revolves not only around fellowship, but around study as well. There's all the youth devotionals. And um, yesterday morning, I didn't see the, the email uh, till later in the day, but Julie, I loved your email that, that you sent me, and I'll tell you why. After a lot of things happened during the day, I finally checked email, and Julie had sent me an email about seven something o'clock yesterday morning. I'd sent out daily bread about 6.53 yesterday morning, and she was just wanting to make sure I knew that the latter part of verse 23 was missing yesterday. And sometimes that happens. See, I copy and paste out of Bible Gateway, and you know all the little hyperlinked footnotes? Uh, Wednesdays are horrible because the New American Standard Bible footnotes everything 
you know, it'll be A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. It goes through, one time it went through the alphabet twice. It starts A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D. Went through the alphabet twice back, back in Luke. But sometimes in erasing those hyperlinks, I'll get a little trigger happy and, you know, some, something else gets erased. But what I loved about this was that she'd already read it five times last week. She had read it on Monday, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and when she gets it on Saturday morning, she reads enough of it to realize all of verse 23 isn't there. Thank you, Julie, you know, for, for letting me know. Because sometimes I don't know. You know, I send these out, and I don't know if it ends up in the spam folder with the Nigerian Prince emails or, <laughs> or what happens. But it's good to hear confirmation that you're studying the scriptures, reading the scriptures daily. When Paul gets to Athens, verse 17, he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with them and so forth, so on and so forth until he appears before this religious council. They don't have governmental authority. This, this is a group that talks about religion and philosophy, the, the Areopagus. But the word that's used here in the NIV, he reasoned in the synagogue, is the same word that appears back in verse 2 in Thessalonica. He, he reasoned with them. And this is the, the Greek verb that means to dialogue. He dialogued with them. I love how Paul is a, a triple threat. Uh, I love triple threat athletes. You know, when we moved to, to Dallas in 97, the Dallas Mavericks were the worst team in professional sports over the previous 10 years. Not just the NBA, Major League Baseball, NFL, uh, NHL. No professional sports team had a worse winning record than the Mavericks over the previous 10 years. A year later, they draft Dirk Nowitzki, and things start to change. And we just, you know, loved following the team onto their championship. But, but Nowitzki's career as a triple threat, whether it was on the perimeter or in the post or in the transition game, and now they've got Luka Doncic, and, and that's wonderful. But Paul was a triple threat. He was at, as much at home in the synagogue as he was in the marketplace, in the shopping malls and the coffee shops, talking to people about... Jesus and how he had to suffer and how he had risen again. And in the halls of academia with the Areopagus or talking with these Epicurean and, and Stoic philosophers. And what he engaged in, according to the text, twice in chapter 17 was respectful discourse and dialogue. To the point that, as Brady read, first thing he says after touring the city is, y'all are really religious people. Y'all are serious about your religion here. You got altars everywhere. And he starts with commendation before he gets to condemnation. I'd like to suggest that how we conduct spiritual conversations is as important as the content of those conversations. And that what we say is no more important than how we say it. 1 Peter 3.15 in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, period. No, not yet. Everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. That's the NIV. The voice, always be ready to offer a defense humbly, and respectfully, when someone asks you why you live in hope, the message, be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks why you're living the way you are, and always with the utmost courtesy. Utmost courtesy, humbly and respectfully, gentleness and respect. And the flow of the text doesn't suggest that how this is some insignificant subordinate clause that really doesn't matter that you know if, if you could swing it, if you're feeling up to it that day, if it's within your natural bent and your demeanor, if it reflects your basic personality type, could you just be kind of cordial about it? Could you be respectful and, and courteous in your conversations with people about spiritual things? 
I think 1 Peter 3.15 describes the exclusive way that God instructs us to have spiritual conversations. And that if we can't muster that, if we can't be gentle or respectful or civil in our discourse about kingdom concerns and spiritual concerns, then God would just have us stay out of the conversation. He would prefer that we not engage in the conversation, not bear witness in his name or testify on, on his behalf. Ephesians 4.15, I think speaking the truth in love is the only God-honoring way to speak the truth because it respects His will and follows His instructions. How do we know if we're speaking lovingly to people? Well, what does 1 Corinthians 13 say about love? It's not just something sweet that we get to read at our wedding ceremonies, which is nice that we get to read it at our wedding ceremonies, but he's just not talking... You know, 1 Corinthians 13 and its description of agape is not just talking about husbands and wives. It's talking about parents and children and brothers and sisters and believers and unbelievers. We know we're speaking the truth in love when we speak, what does it say? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not easily angered. Well, if those things don't typify my speech, maybe, just maybe, I'm not speaking in love, even though I like to say I am. I, it's how I imagine Priscilla and Aquila, and we're coming up on them pretty soon too, taking Apollos aside and instructing him in the way of the Lord more accurately. They, they respected the fact that he was an intelligent person. He was knowledgeable. He was sincere. He was articulate. He was passionate in his faith. He loved God, and he knew the Scriptures. Did he need to be instructed in the way of the Lord more accurately? Yes. But they respected those things about him. We don't impose spiritual con conversations on other people. We invite people into spiritual conversations, just like Jesus invited people into his kingdom. Come to me. Learn from me. Follow me. He never imposed those conversations on anyone. And so we need to make our invitations to others about spiritual things as appealing as, as possible. We don't protest people into the kingdom of God. We don't demean people into the kingdom of God. We don't ridicule them into God's kingdom. We don't insult them into God's kingdom. We don't legislate them into God's kingdom. We invite them on behalf of Jesus into his kingdom. You're familiar with the phrase calm and collected. I think we're called to be calm and convicted. We're expected to be convicted, but I, I love how it's... Go back to verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed when he saw the city full of idols and just completely flipped out. He just lost it. And he started ranting and raving and screaming at everybody that came by. No, he was disturbed. He was convicted about what he saw, but he wasn't frantic. He didn't panic. He didn't peddle fear. He didn't overreact. Um, and I think he sets a beautiful example for us. So he encounters these Epicurean and, and Stoics there, and they're as different as, as night and day, these two schools, prominent schools of philosophy. Epicureans followed the teachings of Epicurus, Epicurus and you know, the, the big force in the cosmos for Epicureans was chance. And so life is just random. The most powerful force is chance and, and life is random. So pleasure and happiness are the greatest goals. Their attitude was, if the gods even exist, they're not worried about us. So Epicureans were the life of the party. Don't worry, be happy was their theme song. Stoics, who followed the teachings of Zeno, believed that fate was the dominant force in the cosmos. And so life is ordered. Life is determined. And so the highest values are duty and responsibility and morality. If the Epicureans were the life of the party, the Stoics were the chaperones at the party. Uh, they were the conscience of the party if they even went to the party. Uh, I don't even, I'm not even sure that the Stoics went to the party. But there's a line in the song Cleopatra by the Lumineers that, that said, but I've read this script and the costume fits, so I'll play my part. I've read the script, costume fits, so I'll play my part. This is my role. This is what it's supposed to be, so I'm just going to live what fate gave me. 
And Paul says it's, it's not chance, it's not fate, it's, it's choice. And that Bob Dylan song from the 1979 album, Slow Train Coming, one of his Christian faith-tinged albums, uh, recorded in Sheffield, Alabama at Muscle Shoals Sound Studios just down the road a little bit from Fame Studios in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Uh, some of you have, have been there. Uh, last, no, nah, not last Friday, a week ago Friday, I was blessed to be the guest of Steve Wan at the Bob Dylan Center in downtown Tulsa. I don't know if Steve is, yes, Steve is here. Thank you, Steve. That was, that was a fun day, and Steve was here at the work day yesterday. If you haven't been to the Bob Dylan Center, I would suggest that you go. It's extremely well done and well presented. Um, Mark Knopfler played on that album. It's been months since I've mentioned Mark Knopfler, and I know you've been missing it, so... I thought I would just throw that in there. That song, Gotta Serve Somebody, did win the Grammy Award in 1980 for Best Performance uh, by a Male Performer, Best Rock Male Vocal Performance. But the song says in the chorus, you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Not chance, not fate, choice. You're going to have to make a choice like free will from Rush. If you choose not to decide, you've still made a choice. You have to choose which way it's going to be. What we see Paul doing in Athens is appropriating culture as a bridge to faith. And so, as you probably discussed in your class, he, he quotes two poets in saying about the true God in whom we live and move and have our being, he's quoting Epimenides uh, a poet who lived in the 6th century B.C. When he says, we are his offspring, he's quoting the 3rd century Stoic poet uh, and author, Aratus. So why does he quote these poets? To use them as a bridge to faith. And so that's why, in a lesson about Acts, we talk about cars in the NBA and Bob Dylan and Mark Knopfler, and Rush, and the Lumineers. They are cultural touch points that help people see and feel some glimpse into a spiritual reality. And then finally, he says, you know, this God I'm telling you about, he's not far from any of us. I don't know if they were ready for Scripture yet, but if they were, he probably laid Psalm 139 on them. Or what James will write in James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Seek him, reach out, and you will find him. And ultimately, he says about this Jesus, and again, I love how the message that he's preaching to these Greek philosophers and the members of the Areopagus, uh, they said this, this was back in verse 18, they said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. He's finding some way without using the Hebrew Bible to teach them about Jesus and the resurrection. And finally, he says, God has set a day. Verse 31, God has set a day when he will judge the world with righteousness or justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead, preaching Christ crucified, preaching Christ raised. God has set a day when Jesus will return and the dead will be raised and everyone will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Romans 14.12 And that will happen on a day and a month and a year. Something like October the 17th, 2022. Two weeks from tomorrow. Are you saying that Jesus is coming back on October the 17th, 22? That's what I just said. He's not. At least I don't, I don't know he is. But it's going to be someday. And it's going to have a date on it just like October the 17th, 2022. But what if he did come back, which he may, two weeks from tomorrow? If you knew that beyond a shadow of a doubt, what would you do for the next two weeks? If you knew Jesus was coming back on October the 17th, what would you do for the next two weeks? What would you do today? What decision would you make today if you knew that you were going to 
look him in his glorious face 15 days from now. Whatever that decision might be, whatever's in your mind, on your heart right now, make the decision now. And let it be known while we're standing and singing this song together. this morning just wanting us to know uh, as his church family that some days are hard for him and some days he struggles especially at work uh, because at work and he he works hard Mike works sometimes 50 hours a week 60 hours a week so he's there a lot and a lot of the people around him don't share his values and his love for God and it frustrates him and sometimes it makes him really angry, and sometimes in that anger he says things that, that he really didn't intend to say, or feel like he wants to say, but sometimes it just happens. And so he wants us to pray that God will help him to manage that situation um, through God's power and, and strength, and to control that anger, and, and with God's help, um, control what he says. So let's pray for Mike. Father, thank you for your promise of your nearness. We do thank you, Father, that we cannot be anywhere where you aren't. So thank you, Father, in, in life, in death, in joy, in sorrow, in victory, and, and in struggles, you are there. And Father, we pray for our, our brother Mike that he be attuned to your, your presence with him, not just when he's here, but, but when he is at work as well. And may he feel your presence and consciously be aware of it throughout the day and to know that, that you are there to provide uh, strength and, and wisdom. And so, Father, as, as he encounters frustrations and, and difficulties and stresses at, at work, Father, help him not to be focused on, on what others say and do, but just to focus on surrendering himself to you as, as a living sacrifice. Thank you for the encouragement that he is to us, to his faithfulness to you, and to us as his church family. And, Father, we ask these blessings for him in Jesus' name. Amen.
A few weeks ago, the results of a new survey were released by Ligonier Ministries and Lifeway Research. Now, I don't really know much about them, except that they were reported on, these results were, by the Christianity Today magazine on September 19th. Their survey called the State of Theology is conducted every two years, and this year's report had a few we might call concerning trends I want to share with you. For example, they found that 53% of adults did not believe that the Bible was literally true. In other words, it's a sacred, sacred writing, but it simply contains helpful accounts of ancient myths. Of course, now that's 53% of all adults, but one of the more concerning aspects was that they found that 26% of evangelical Christians believe the same thing. In fact, uh, they commented on that and said that this view makes it easy for individuals to accept biblical teaching that they resonate with, while simultaneously rejecting any biblical teachings that are out of step with their own personal views or with cultural views. Let me share with you the top three mistaken beliefs that they found. Number one, Jesus isn't the only way to God. 56% said that God accepts the worship of all religions. Number two, Jesus was created by God. Astonishingly, 73% agreed with the statement that Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. And the third, 43% of evangelicals agreed with the belief that Jesus was a great teacher, but that he was not God. Now certainly these statistics and beliefs are concerning and discouraging. What we need is good doctrinal teaching in our pulpits, in our classes, and in our homes. And I'm grateful to say that I know that the church here at Broken Arrow does teach sound doctrine. And hopefully we're the type of Christians who regularly want to learn more about God and actually learn to know God. And as Peter said, as we've heard this morning, to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks the reason for the hope that we have. Incorrect or wrong beliefs are not new to Christianity. Certain religious people have been espousing and imposing unsupported and undoctrinal beliefs on others for hundreds of years, perhaps even thousands. In Acts chapter 15, Peter stood before the apostles and elders in Jerusalem and he shared the truth that he had recently learned. He told the group, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And, and he made no distinction between us and them having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. Our hope of salvation, our confident expectation of salvation, our assurance that we are reconciled with God comes from the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We show our faith and our commitment through our communion with and our worship of Him as we draw near to Him. It has always been that way and always will be that way, regardless of the world, 
wants to say or what the survey reports results to us. pray as we enter into this time of communion our father in heaven we are so thankful for this day that you've given us father we're thankful for the um, chance that we can meet here as brothers and sisters and and to be able to participate in this this communion service father we are thankful for the 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 gift that you gave us of of eternal life and salvation through the the sending of your son to to die on the cross for our sins Father, we, we know that we are, are sinful and, and oftentimes unworthy of, of this salvation. And Father, we are so thankful, though, that you have freely given us this through your grace. Father, we are thankful that Jesus did go to the cross, that he allowed his, his body to be broken, his blood to be shed on that cross so that, we, um, that he could be the perfect sacrifice for us. Father, at this time, as we partake of this bread, we ask that your blessings would be upon us. Help us to do this in an acceptable and pleasing manner. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we glorify your name. We are just so thankful for the resurrection of your son, Jesus, that he sits in the heavenly places by your side, reigning with all authority over this world and over your body. We are so grateful for that resurrection. It brings some comfort as we think about the blood that was shed on that cross, the agony and the pain that he had to go through on our behalf to, to save us, to reconcile us, to wash away our sins. Father, so many of us has, have children, and the idea of watching our children go through that kind of anguish and that kind of pain, it's, and to do that and to have him go through that for our enemies, Father, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to think. But that's, that's what you did for us. But knowing he's raised gives us hope. It gives us strength. Thank you, Father, for the forgiveness that we enjoy, for the peace that we have and the hope that we have of a resurrection in the future for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
stand together for our last song this morning. I'm glad to see you here this morning. Glory to God, Jesus is Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Let's sing about the everlasting God. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. contribution, you can leave it in one of the trays in the back um, during the week, leave it with the office in front, or you can make your contributions online. Let's pray, please. Father, we want to thank you for the many blessings in this life, for the ability that you've given us to earn an income, and uh, we ask that you take these offerings we give, use it for the furtherance of your kingdom. And Lord, we want to thank you that you're, you're with us at all times, that you gave us this time to join together in communion and fellowship with one another and help us to realize the mystery of your presence with us daily. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> 